Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful privilege uh, to be uh, at Southern and uh, perfectly illustrates the fact that whilst I believe the Bible is inerrant, um, the introduction was not. And uh, lest you be distracted by the gymnastics of wondering how I could have been married for 13 years and have two grandchildren, uh, the truth of the matter is that I've been married for 40 years. And um, turn with me now to something that is actually inerrant. Uh, <laughs> and that is uh, Romans chapter 8 and uh, two verses, verses 31 and 32. Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. What shall we say to these things? This is the peroration of one of the most majestic chapters in all of the Scriptures. I preached a series of sermons on more than one occasion on the eighth chapter of Romans, and I called it without realizing that the late Jim Boyce had also referred to the eighth chapter using this title, the best chapter in the Bible. There was a deacon, there's always a deacon. Uh, there was a deacon uh, who took objection to the title, told me so at the door of the church that in suggesting that one chapter of the Bible was the best, I perhaps inadvertently had given the impression that I believed in an errant view of Scripture, namely that some chapters were more inspired than others. And I said, chill. I said, here's the test, it's the, it's the two minutes before you die test, and you have a choice. I'm, I'm the chaplain, I've come to visit you on your deathbed, and you may choose from the first chapter of Chronicles or Romans 8, which is it? <laughs> a, a, a list of names or the glorious eighth chapter of Romans? I happen to believe that the list of names is also divinely inspired and inerrant and free from error. But I want the eighth chapter of Romans when I die. <laughs> what then shall we say to these things? What things? And perhaps Paul is referring to the eighth chapter of Romans. Perhaps he's referring to what he had said in the opening verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a glorious text. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Those who are in union and communion with Christ. There is nothing for God to condemn. He sees no sin. He sees no guilt. He sees no deviancy. He sees no aberration. He doesn't see any breaking of the law. He doesn't see any transgression. He doesn't see any fault. He doesn't see any blame. There is no condemnation. What does he see of the one who is in union and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ? He sees the righteousness of God. He sees perfection. He sees law keeping. He sees covenant keeping. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Perhaps he's thinking about that. Perhaps he's thinking about how he has expounded that in terms of the giving of the Holy Spirit in the latter part of Romans chapter 8. I only have 20 minutes. I can't, 
I can't explore this in the depth to which I would love to explore it this morning, but let's go to the middle to the ending of the eighth chapter of Romans, all that emphasis on the Holy Spirit. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, a spirit that witnesses with our spirits that we are the children of God and if children heirs and, and, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The Spirit who helps us in, in, in our infirmities, the Spirit who comes alongside us. What shall we then say to these things? If you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, the personal representative agent of the Lord Jesus, the one who indwelt Jesus from the moment of his conception until the moment of his death and burial and resurrection and ascension, and in terms of his humanity, still indwells him. Who knows Jesus better than anyone knows the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit? What shall we then say to these things if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Perhaps he's thinking of the entire book of Romans. Perhaps he's thinking of the exposition of sin in chapters 2 and 3. Perhaps he's thinking of his exposition of justification by faith alone, the article of the standing or falling of the church. This is a Reformation week, isn't it? We are fast approaching October 31st. We think of 1517 when a monk with a mallet nailed the 95 theses to the castle church door and said, and, 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 and gave objection, made a stand. We cannot be silent. Is that the name of the book? We cannot be silent. Well, Martin Luther wasn't silent. And then four years later at the Diet of Worms in 1521, when he had been accused of heresy, making those extraordinary statements at least attributed to Martin Luther, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. What shall we then say to these things? If God justifies the ungodly, if I'm reckoned to be righteous through the imputation of the righteousness of Christ, my sins reckoned to Christ, His righteousness reckoned to my account, what shall we then say to these things if, if double imputation is true? As Paul expounds it in Romans 5. What, what about Romans 6? We have died with Christ. We've been buried by Him, with Him in baptism, raised again to newness of life. What shall we then say to these things if that is true? That the old man is dead. We are no longer Adamic in our natures. We are, we, are, we are Christians. We are in Christ. We are in fellowship with Christ. We are in communion with Christ. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? There are three things that Paul is alluding to here. He's referring to something that is true about God the Father. He is referring to something that is true about God the Son. He is referring to something that is true about the Holy Spirit. He's referring, first of all, to something that is true about God the Father. What shall we then say to these things if God is for us? Who is the God that he is referring to here? Well, he's referring to God the Father. He goes on to say, he that spared not his own son. The he is God the Father. This is something, this is a statement about God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. He is for us. What a wonderful thing to be able to say on a cold, damp day in Kentucky that God is for us in a miserable world that doesn't know where it's going to be able to say, God is for me. I think Paul is probably citing from one of the Psalms, Psalm 56, this I know, God is for me. It's a Psalm that explores the depth and depravity of sin and the chaos of the world and, and the turmoils and trials that the Psalmist finds himself in, but then he says, this, this one thing I know, God is for me. A wonderful thing to be able to say. Do you know, are you able to say that, my friend? You may be at seminary. You may be a seminary student, but that doesn't mean to say that you can say, God is for me. You have an assurance that you are in a right relationship with God, that your sins are forgiven, that you have peace with God, that you are heading for that glorious city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This I know. God is for me. 
And then he goes on to say something else. He who did not spare his own son. The verb that Paul employs here is a verb that is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, in Genesis chapter 22, the story of Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice of, of Isaac. And God spared him, provided a, a lamb that was caught in a bush nearby, substituted that, that lamb on behalf of, of, of Isaac. God spared Abraham's son, but he did not spare his own son. Well, let's think about that for a minute. The father who had known his son from all eternity with a love that we cannot begin to comprehend and appreciate. And he did not spare him. He did not spare him. Some of you know the book by Nicholas Walterstorff. Nicholas Walterstorff, the philosopher, theologian. I've read, I've read a great deal of Nicholas Walterstorff. It's not easy reading. He says things that I don't frankly understand. He thinks on a plane that I generally don't think on, nor wish to think on. I thank God for his abilities and his contributions in the area of philosophy. But it's another book that I'm referring to this morning, a book about his son who died on a climbing expedition, and he fell to his death. He was in his 20s. The book is called Lament for a Son. And people say, how should I introduce you? I should have told you how to introduce me this morning. How do, you, how do you introduce Nicholas Walterstoff as a philosopher, as a theologian, and the thought that goes through his head, the bubble that's in his head? I'm someone who has lost a son. That's what he says. It defines him. It has reshaped, remodulated, recalibrated his life. He is someone who's lost a son. Not a day goes by without that thought. He is someone who has lost a son. God the Father has lost a son. He knows what it is to lose a son. He knows what it is to stand before a, a grave. He knows what it is to experience. Yes, I think I can say this. He knows what it is in the infinite mind and heart of Almighty God, a God who cannot change. But he has stood before the grave of his own son. He did not spare him. Who killed the Lord Jesus? That's a great question, isn't it? It's an important question, my friend. Who killed the Lord Jesus? Was it the Jews? Well, yes, it was. It was you, Peter says, on the day of Pentecost, who took him and slew him. But it was all by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. There's Peter on the day of Pentecost expressing the Note of absolute and total sovereignty. Nothing happens without God willing it to happen. Nothing happens without God willing it to happen before it happens. Nothing happens without God willing it to happen in the way that it happens. Who killed the Lord Jesus? Was it Herod? Was it Pilate? Was it the Roman authorities? Was it Judas? All of them had a hand to play in the death of the Lord Jesus. But ultimately, as we think of ultimate causation. Who killed the Lord Jesus? It was the Heavenly Father. He did not spare Him. He did not spare Him. You know, the greatest question that we can ever ask, how is it right that the Lord Jesus died? That's a very scary question, philosophically and theologically. How is it right? Why is it right that the Lord Jesus should die if Jesus is without sin? If he is sinless, if he is impeccable? 
death is the wages of sin, but he did not sin. He did not transgress God's law. He did not violate God's commandments. He did not fall short of the requirements of God. He kept the law perfectly and absolutely. He rendered obedience to the task of his mediatorial calling. It is finished, he cried on the cross. So why did he die? What right, what, what justice is there in the universe if you can obey the law and obey it perfectly and still die at the end of it? Where is justice? That's a very difficult question. It's an important question. There are, of course, only two answers. One answer is the answer of despair, that there is no justice in the universe. There's no justice in the universe, and there's no justice in God. And he can act whimsically and arbitrarily. You can obey the law, you can keep the law, and you can still die. That's one possible answer. Another answer is substitution. He died, my friend, because at the point at which he died, he deserved to die. Because he was the greatest sinner the world had ever seen. God made him sin, who knew no sin. He reckoned him sin. He imputed sin to his account. He, he federally imputed our sin to Christ, so that at the point at which he died, it was the just thing. It was the only thing that God could do. He did not spare him. He turned his back on him. He poured out his unmitigated Wrath, wrath on him. <laughs> there is something in this text about God, our heavenly Father. What wondrous love is this? I have a son. Cannot imagine, cannot begin to imagine what it means to not spare him. I want to spare him a thousand things. I want to step in. I want to intervene. Even in those occasions when I know it's good for him to pass through these trials and difficulties, I still, my heart, my heart tells me I want to intervene. I want, I want to spare him that pain, that sense of loss, that sense of grief. I cannot imagine. The infinite heart and mind of God that he does not spare his own son. What, what wondrous love is this? There's something here about the son. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, or perhaps delivered him up for us all. It's the same verb that is used in the Gospels, Matthew in particular, that Jesus was delivered up he was delivered up to Herod. He was delivered up to Pilate. He was delivered up to the Sanhedrin. He was delivered up to be crucified. Oh, our wonderful and glorious Savior in the councils of eternity, entering into a covenant with His heavenly Father. You can perhaps imagine it. How will the lost tribes of Adam be rescued and redeemed? How will sinners be saved? And you can imagine a conversation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the Son says, I will go. A bit like Frodo in Lord of the Rings. I will go, though I know not the way. I will go to be made a curse for us, to endure, let's think of, let's think of his baptism for a minute, by John the Baptist, not Christian baptism, but, but John the Baptist's baptism, a baptism of repentance. You remember John's misgivings when Jesus first approaches him at the onset of his public ministry. 
So for it to be so now to fulfill all righteousness, this is the path that the mediator must traverse. This is the direction which the Lord Jesus must follow. He must be baptized. He must receive a baptism that is a symbol of the water ordeal of judgment. When Paul speaks about I realize I'm on difficult territory here as a Presbyterian and Southern speaking about baptism, but we're talking about <laughs> the theological meaning of baptism. What does baptism mean? Think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. What illustration does he use? Well, he uses the illustration of the Exodus. We were baptized into Moses and into the sea. What, what does he mean? Moses and those in union with Moses, Moses and those under the leadership of Moses were saved. And that baptism drowned the Egyptians. It was a water ordeal of judgment. Think of Peter. What illustration does Peter use when he talks about baptism? He talks about Noah, Noah and the flood. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, they were saved. They were delivered in the ark. But the rest of humanity suffered the water ordeal of judgment. Well, that's, what, that's the significance of the baptism of Jesus. He is undergoing the water ordeal of judgment. He's delivered up to it. And willingly he goes. I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. At the end of a service, typically, there is a benediction. Perhaps the benediction from 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and so on. Or perhaps the ironic benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. At the end of a service, we hear the gospel words of peace. We get peace. We get wholeness. We get integration. We get a sense of being and purpose in Christ, in the gospel. But Jesus, what did he get? The Lord curse you and drive you away. And the anathema of God come down upon you and give you hell. He got the curse so that we might get the blessing. What shall we then say to these things? If, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? There's something about the Father, there's something about the Son, but there's also something about the Holy Spirit in this text. How does the Father freely give us all things? And what are the all things? Well, it's not cars. It's not houses. It's not pots of gold that he's talking about. He's talking about, about God's purposes in redemption to bring us home to himself. It's the all things that he has mentioned in verse 28, and we know that for the, those who love God, all things work together for good. In God's providence, He applies the work of the finished work of the Redeemer to us so that we might be brought home to Himself in fellowship, as we were singing at the beginning of our service this morning. You remember how John Calvin, in Book 3 of the Institutes, after he has expounded the personal work of Christ in Book 2 of the Institutes, he begins Book 3 and he says, how are, the, how are the things that Christ has achieved, how are they made, well, how are they made effective in our lives? Because unless they are made effective in our lives, all that Christ has achieved is, is useless and of no value to us. And the answer is, of course, by the Holy Spirit the representative agent of the Lord Jesus who comes down at Pentecost in fulfillment of the promise of the Lord Jesus in the upper room, I go away, but I will come to you again. And he comes now 
to shine a light upon the Lord Jesus, to apply all that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf as our sin-bearer and substitute, so that all things, all things that are necessary, all things that will bring us home into the embrace of our loving Heavenly Father will actually be achieved and brought about. How shall He not also with Him freely, graciously give us all things? My dear friend, you love the Lord Jesus. You trust Him. You trust Him alone for your salvation. You look to no other. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. What does that mean? Well, it means security. It means gospel security. It means covenant love. It means He will not let you go. He may put you in a trial. He may put you in a dark place. God moves in mysterious ways His wonders to perform. He plants His footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. But my dear friend, when you trust in the Lord Jesus, you can be absolutely certain, you can be absolutely confident that He will never let you go. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what he goes on to expound. Well, that's my thought for you today. As you go about your various duties, as you go to class, as you go about the issues that are on your calendar for today, when you look to the Lord Jesus and you trust in Him alone, you can say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Not Satan, not his hordes. We are safe and we are secure in union and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, may God bless His Word to us. Father, we thank You. Thank You for this text. We have barely scratched the surface of it. Thank You for your eternal love and purpose in embracing us and bringing us to know the Savior. And we pray today that in the assurance of gospel love, we might run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.